So, in continuation with our discussions on audio coding, in this lecture we are going to talk about the AC3 decoder. In the last lecture we had seen about the basic aspects of AC3 and uh, in this one we will specifically look at the details of the decoder that exactly what the decoder has to do and uh, the concept of the MDCT or to say the time domain alias cancellation which I made a brief mention in the uh, last lecture. So, that I will be explaining. So, before going into the actual topic about the AC3 decoder, I will digress slightly and uh, cover the portions that is related to the uh, time domain alias cancellation and realization of the subband filtering through the time domain alias cancellation technique. Now, before we go into that concept, let us uh, begin from the basic fundamental aspects of it and uh, there let us uh, first take a signal or rather to say discrete samples of a signal which we call as x of n and let us say that we put it through a bank of analysis filters. So, we put it through an analysis filter bank. So, what this analysis filter bank is going to do is to uh, I mean divide this signal into several sub bands okay, and individually the sub band outputs will be available. So, let us denote these by x suffix k of m okay, where m is the index of the uh, sequence and this uh, subscript k what we are using is actually the sub band number. So, we will begin with x 0 of m okay, so that the next sub band output will be x 1 of m and so on and let us say that we have got k minus 1 I mean up to k minus 1 that means to say that altogether we are having k such sub bands. Okay. So, k is equal to 0, 1 up to capital K minus 1. So, these are the sub band in indices. And uh, uh, this x k of m, this indicates the sub band samples or what we obtain after filtering this x of n through the different sub band. So, x k of m basically indicates that what is the uh, kth filter response. Okay. Uh, when the signal x of n is put through this analysis filter bank. So, analysis filter bank basically analyzes the signal into several such sub bands and there are up to capital K number of such sub bands which are available at the output of this analysis, uh, analysis filter bank. And uh, correspondingly, when we want to recover the signal x of n, what we have to do is to put a synthesis filter bank and the synthesis filter bank inputs we are designating as the first one we are designating as x0 cap m, the second one we are designating as x1 cap m and the last one we are indicating as x k minus 1 cap m and this is put through a synthesis filter bank and the output of synthesis filter bank is going to give us x cap of n. Now, why we are using this caps? Basically, this x 0 to x k minus 1, these are all the samples, right? 
these samples we can encode and they can go into the digital channel and if the channel is noiseless, if it is a lossless channel, then x 0 m and x 0 cap m they become the same. right? So, uh, in, in, in case of lossless channels, we always have x k of m equals to x k cap of m for lossless channels. But even if the channel is lossless, there is no guarantee that x n and x cap n will be the same, because that will basically depend upon how we analyze and how we synthesize. If the synthesis is done in exact replica to what is being done in the analysis, then only we can say that x cap n becomes equal to x of n. But in the process of analysis, if any artifact or if any uh, distortion is introduced, that distortion has to be correspondingly corrected or that artifact has to be correspondingly corrected in the synthesis. Only then we will be able to have a perfect reconstruction. So, there is a definite condition which can be established mathematically for the perfect reconstruction of the signal in the synthesis filter bank. Okay. Now, how do we realize this kind of analysis filter and synthesis filter? There are two approaches for that. In one approach, one can have a bank of filters okay? and uh, in, in such kind of cases, we will be uh, basically just putting a band of filters and the filter outputs individually, the filter outputs will be the same type of samples in the time domain. So, we are uh, feeding to the filter bank time domain samples as the input and at the output of the filter bank, we will be getting time domain samples at the output. So, basically what we are going to have is that x of n will be fed as an input okay, and it goes to the several bank of filters. Okay. So, the first one has to be a low pass filter because if the um, uh, if, if, if this signal x n has a bandwidth of let us say 0 to some bandwidth b, let us say that the signal is band limited to b okay, and it is 0 to b that is the um, uh, uh, bandwidth of the signal. In that case, the first filter that we have to use is the low pass filter 0 to some low pass cutoff frequency will be uh, some cutoff frequency will be there and then the next bank of filters will be the band pass filters right and the last one will cover a frequency up to b in fact we have to sample the signal at a rate of 2b if if it is band limited to b so these are the bank of the uh, bank of filters that we realize and individually at this filter outputs, we will be observing the signal as I indicated. This will be x 1 m, this will be x 2 m and this will be or, or x 0 we start with x 0 x 1 and this will be x k minus 1 m. Okay. So, this is how we can realize and individually its frequency responses of the filters will be like this that if we make a plot of the gains of this filter bank okay on this axis if we plot the frequency and on the vertical axis if we plot the gain then the first filter bank as i have already mentioned is going to be a low pass filter now supposing this is the cutoff frequency that we want for the low pass filter now, ideally I should design a filter like this where it goes up to here and then it comes down and then that is 0 throughout the rest of the frequencies, but I can never make an ideal filter. 
So, my practical filter realization could be something like this. So, this would be the gain versus frequency plot okay, for the low pass filter. Now, uh, after the low pass filter, we will be having the first band pass filter. Right? So, the first band pass filter will have its uh, lower cutoff frequency over here. Okay? So, uh, uh, supposing this is the upper cutoff frequency of the low pass filter and this is the lower cutoff frequency of the band pass filter. So, the next band pass filter will have its uh, gain versus frequency response like this. So, this will be for the second filter. Now, this is, this is going to have an upper cutoff frequency somewhere over here and this is, so if this is the upper cutoff frequency, again the next band pass will have its lower cutoff frequency over here and it goes up to here. Okay. The next band will be having the upper cutoff frequency like this and the lower cutoff frequency for the next filter would be like this. So, this is how the responses will be there and the last filter has to be a high pass filter. So, if this is where the last band pass filter ends, okay, then we are going to have a high pass filter beyond this. So, if the last stage is a high pass filter, the first stage is a low pass filter and in between we have all the filters as the band pass filters, then this is the kind of gain versus frequency response that is what we will be getting for the individual filters. Now, the question is that if this is the gain versus frequency plots of the individual filters, okay, then is it possible for us to have a perfect reconstruction. If we have a have an analysis filter bank realized this way okay, and then we put a corresponding synthesis filter bank, can we have a perfect reconstruction? Well, here if you see the um, uh, frequency, uh, I mean gain versus frequency responses, okay, you can see that after all what are we going to achieve? Okay, for a perfect reconstruction, there should not be any frequency distortion of the signal. So, that means to say that if we add up the responses of this individual filters, okay, then we should be getting a flat frequency response throughout this thing. Okay. We should be getting a flat frequency response. So, in order to get a flat frequency response, what is the condition that one has to fulfill? You see, look at the low pass filter. We are saying that this is the cutoff frequency. If this is the cutoff frequency, in that case, what are these components? What are these frequency components? These frequency components are then the alias components. Okay. So, the alias components will be appearing this way. Similarly, for this filter, the alias components of here will be appearing this way, so that the response that we get in this zone, okay, they are the aliased filter responses. Okay. These are the aliasing components. So, likewise here also we will be having the aliased components. Now, in order to get a flat response, what should we do? We should get a, uh, we should uh, have a proper alias cancellation during the synthesis. If we add up and then we have an alias cancellation in the synthesis process, then only we can get a flat frequency response. So, the alias cancellation that we are doing in this case is a frequency domain alias cancellation.
in short form we can call that as f d a c which stands for frequency domain alias cancellation. Now look at this characteristics what you find is that in terms of the frequency responses of the individual filters there is an overlap that is present. Can you see the overlap because unless the overlap is there see first of all that we could not realize a, um, a perfectly rectangular response filters that is ruled out. Okay? We cannot practically achieve that. So, that is why a practical filter has to have this kind of a characteristic and that is why in terms of its frequency response also there is an overlapping that exists in its uh, frequency bands. Right? So, now uh, overlapping in the frequency domain characteristic and realizing a frequency domain alias cancellation that is exactly what we do if we realize the analysis uh, filter bank in this manner having individual low pass and high pass filters. Now, here all the processing is being done in the time domain, but the alias cancellation that we are doing is a frequency domain alias cancellation, but rest of the processing everything is in the time domain. Now, let us look at an alternative way of realizing this analysis and synthesis filter. In this case what we want to do is to have the filtering in the transform domain rather than in the time domain we would like to have a transform domain filtering. How? Let us say that we feed this signal x of n the samples and these samples are first windowed. Okay? We apply a window okay, whether rectangular window or some other window. Okay? Some window we apply some windowing function we apply onto it and then the windowed version of the signal let us put through a transform say DCT, DFT some kind of a transform we do. And then the transformed signals that is what we get. Okay. These transforms will basically correspond to the individual sub bands follow my point. That means to say that uh, if you are looking for the uh, low frequency part okay, in that case where will you get this in the transform supposing uh, you uh, take n number of samples you take capital n number of samples and you obtain an n point dct okay you window n number of samples and then on windowed n number of samples you apply a dct so then the uh, dc part of the dct that means to say that the very first coefficient if you if you look at it okay and if uh, so you are getting the very fast coefficient as the dc or the lowest frequency and here you will be getting the highest frequency component now when the next uh, next frame of xn arrives okay you again perform a windowing and then again you will be observing the lowest frequency here highest frequency here so if you continuously monitor this okay what will you get all the lowest frequency samples if you continuously monitor this what will you get all the highest frequency samples so this is also a filter realization only thing is that here we are first having a time domain windowing and the time domain windowing is followed by a frequency domain transformation. So, now in the frequency domain transformation the signals that you are getting at the analysis filter output they are not in the time domain, but they are now in the frequency domain. So, what you have to do you send this frequency domain samples into the channel assume that the channel is lossless as before 
then this frequency domain samples now you put through an inverse transformation. Okay? You apply the inverse transform of exactly what you had done in the analysis filter and the inverse transform output okay, that you um, uh, now get at the, at the uh, inverse you are getting it in the time domain, but again you have to compensate for this windowing. And in this case, what we can do is that because we have to compute the uh, transforms in a continuous manner, the window also should be an overlapping window. If we talk of overlapping window, in that case, we can apply a duality of what we had as an overlapping window like this. In this case, this also is a window, but this is a window in the frequency domain. Okay? But likewise, if we apply a windowing in time domain and if that, if those time domain windowing is also an overlapped one. In that case, what we are doing is that on the signal, we are applying overlapped time domain windowing, taking a transform of those okay, at the synthesis part, taking inverse transform of this and then on these windows, okay, the corresponding uh, synthesis has to be applied, which has to be done in a manner of overlap and add technique. Now, in this case, while doing the overlap and add technique, what did we achieve? We achieved frequency domain alias cancellation. Now, in this scheme, what we are going to achieve? The windowing is in the time domain. So, mind you, what we are doing is that this x of n, okay, these are the samples which are say arriving in a buffer. Supposing we are storing the incoming samples in a buffer and this buffer contents are put through a window. So, this is a window that is applied on the buffered samples and then on this windowed samples what we do is we apply transform and the transform outputs are this, which we take as the sub band signals. Now, this buffer what we are having is an overlapping kind of a buffer, meaning that it is not that here we store n samples, take the window and then take the next n samples and take the window, not like this. Rather, I mean there is a degree of overlap and the degree of overlap is 50 percent overlap is applied. So, 50 percent overlap if you want to achieve, what you have to do is that once you take a windowing on n number of samples okay, in the first frame, then what you have to do that in the next frame, you shift n by 2 samples out of it and let n, number, n by 2 number of new samples arrive. So, you are having n by 2 number of new samples, you have n by 2 number of old samples and then you apply the window. In that case, what you are doing? You are having the windowing, but with an overlap, something very similar to this. Okay? But this you did in the frequency domain and this you are doing in time domain. So, in the process of synthesis, what you want to achieve is time domain alias cancellation. In short form, this is called as the TDAC. Okay? Now, this I have uh, only qualitatively described and rather try to uh, explain this to you uh, conceptually, but there is a 
very involved and nice mathematical treatment which is available and I would advise you to go through this uh, reference. The reference is like uh, this, it is by John Prinsen, John P. Prinsen and A. B. Bradley. And this is analysis synthesis filter bank design based on time domain alias cancellation. This paper appeared in IEEE transactions on acoustic speech and signal processing. In short form, ASSP, volume 34, number 5, October 1986, page numbers 1153 to 1161. Okay. So, you can consult Princeton and Bradley's paper, they have analytically developed the theory and analytically they have proved that how the time domain alias cancellation could be achieved. Okay. But I described the same thing to you qualitatively and now let me tell you in a block diagram form that uh, how we are going to achieve that. Okay. The time domain alias cancellation based on the analysis synthesis filter this is achieved like this that supposing we have the input signal and let us say that uh, we have the input signal like this. So, this is the window that we are applying uh, not my, my, my drawing is not very right. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, what I mean to say is that uh, supposing this duration from here to here means in between these windows we are having m number of samples. Now, in this case m is our block length, capital M is our block length and we uh, have the sample index as n equal to small m into capital M, where small m happens to be the block number. Now, what I mean to say is that this is one block of samples, this is the next block of samples. So, can you see the overlap? This block of samples has got this much. Now, this is a windowing function. So, it is purposefully drawn so as to appear this as non rectangular window. So, you can see that this is a kind of windowing that we have applied over here and the next uh, blocks window is like this, which contains some of the samples of the earlier window also at least 50 percent of the samples of the earlier window is also there and then some new samples which are also coming in. And then again the next window goes from here to here 
Okay, the next window goes from here to here like this. So, uh, these are the windowed version of the signals okay. and then on this we are applying transforms. Okay. So, these are the analysis filtering part. So, this is the analysis part and then the analysis output will be x 0 m to x k of m. Mind you these are in the frequency domain, okay. k is equal to 0, 1 up to capital K minus 1 and here we have the inverse transformation. this is the inverse transform and this is synthesis part and then the inverse transform output what we do is we overlap and add. So, the overlap and add is actually done using a window like this. So, the, the inverse transform output, so these are the inverse transform output. So, they are put through a synthesis window. Okay. The synthesis window is like this okay, which perform and the synthesis window we apply an overlap and add. So, this is the synthesis window and the overlap and add is done in order to correct for the time domain aliasing which is introduced, right. So, that the reconstructed signal would then be like this, that whatever we have got as the windowing, okay. okay. So, here we will be getting the reconstructed signal at the output of those overlap and add blocks. Okay. So, the synthesis has to take care of this in order to cancel the time domain aliasing. Now, this is the basic concept and in fact, the transform what is being done is actually a DCT but when you are taking an overlapped, uh, I mean DCT on these overlapped samples, okay. So, that means to say that DCT plus this kind of a 50 percent overlapping window, okay, this compositely realizes what is called as the modified discrete cosine transform, MDCT, which is the modified discrete cosine transform, which is the DCT applied over this overlapped window. Now, we go back to our AC3 codec okay, and see that how this concept is utilized, I mean how we are making use of this MDCT block in the AC3 decoder. So, let us recollect the frame structure of the AC3. Now, in the frame what are we having? So, say in this part we have the input AC3 frame. So, the input AC3 frame will be containing the exponent and the mantissa information corresponding to all the channels that it is encoding, right. So, what you have to do in the first place is to do the exponent un unpacking 
actually exponent unpacking you can do directly because exponent unpacking is not dependent upon the bit allocation information. Okay. You do not have to extract the bit allocation information. In fact, what will be done is based on this exponent information, the bit allocation information will be generated by the decoder itself. So, what we do is that from the AC3 frame, we extract the exponent part. So, this is the exponent unpacking. And then we will be putting this exponents, okay, all this extracted exponents will be put into an MDCT buffer. Okay. So, this we are calling as the MDCT buffer and this MDCT buffer is actually what is it containing? It is containing the uh, frequency bands because already these samples what we are uh, receiving here, they are all frequency domain samples. So, we have to do an inverse transformation before we uh, actually obtain the reconstructed signal. But so far we are dealing everything in the MDCT domain. So, all the exponent unpacking what we obtain here are all the MDCT coefficients. So, the MDCT coefficients will be put into a buffer and in fact, the MDCT which is applied in the AC3 encoder is a 512 point MDCT. In fact, in AC3 this 512 point MDCT can be switched into 2 to 56 points in MDCTs by what is called as the switched bank technique. Okay. And the switched bank technique is applied whenever any transient is detected in the audio frame. When any transient is detected, then the 512 point MDCT will be split into 2 to 256 point MDCT by the switched uh, uh, bank MDCT computation. But, but uh, all that I mean to say here is that after the exponent unpacking, it goes into the MDCT buffer. And that means to say that individually all these components will indicate the corresponding frequency bands. Now, totally uh, we have, I mean going by the critical uh, band philosophy okay, in order to extract the uh, masking information, the auditory spectrum I mean according to the M, uh, AC3 uh, decoding, it is divided into 50 such uh, critical bands. Okay. So, we have the MDCT buffer information uh, segregated into this 50 bands. So, band 0, band 1, etcetera okay, up to band 49. Okay. So, all the uh, so, the MDCT coefficients, this 512 MDCT coefficients will be divided into uh, 50 such bands. Okay. And using these bands, I mean using the coefficients which we obtain from these banks, the bit allocation information can be derived by using the psychoacoustic model. So, the bit allocation will be decided over here. Okay. Now, at the same time, the input AC3 frame, we are not only deriving the exponent, but also we are deriving the mantissa. So, we do the mantissa unpacking. Okay. So, this is one block where we do the mantissa unpacking. And then the bit allocation information that goes into a band buffer 
because the bit allocation will be pertaining to a band. So, there is a band buffer that uh, contains the bit allocation information for that particular band and that controls the mantissa unpacking because the mantissa remember was encoded based on the bit allocation information. So, it has to be decoded also by consulting with the bit allocation. So, for that particular band whatever bit allocation information is extracted that will decide that how many mantissa uh, bits will be extracted from the bit stream and accordingly the extracted mantissa will go into a band buffer. So, mind you the purpose of these two band buffers are different. This left hand side band buffer stores the bit allocation information whereas, the right hand side band buffer that stores the mantissa information, the extracted mantissa information. Now, here we are getting the exponent information already stored in the MDCT buffer. Now, we require both the exponent as well as the extracted mantissa information. So, what we do is that the output of this band buffer is combined with the uh, exponent information and we perform mantissa scaling and denormalization. So, this is where we do mantissa scaling plus denormalization. And then this mantissa scaling and denormalization information is actually stored into the MDCT buffer. The same MD, so this MDCT buffer will be actually replaced by this. So, this is also a MDCT buffer. So, th this earlier information which contain only the exponent will now be replaced by the information, the complete information of exponent plus mantissa into this MDCT buffer, right. So, now what we are doing, we see here we could not do any inverse transformation, that was not possible because we only had the exponent information. But now in, in this, okay, at the MDCT buffer here, we are getting both exponent and mantissa information. So, now this information we are able to uh, obtain the inverse transformation of this. So, we ob, uh, so we apply the inverse transformation, but the complete inverse transformation process should involve the inverse transformation plus the overlap and add. So, what we do in this case is the overlap and add part is tackled separately okay, and instead we just take the inverse transformation and because the overlap and add part is avoided, we call that as the partial inverse transform. So, this MDCT buffer output from here okay, will be taken like this. So, the MDCT buffer output, the MDCT buffer output that contains the exponent as well as the mantissa information, this goes into a block which does the partial transformation, partial inverse transformation, partial inverse transform and this goes into a block which performs the down mixing. Now, I was telling you about down mixing in the last lecture. Basically, what we mean to say is that the number of channels that we are using at the encoder and the number of channels that we use at the decoder, they need not be the same. So, that is why this inverse transformation information is uh, put through a down mixing which uh, stores the down mixed information into two buffers. Actually speaking, this is also to realize the switched uh, um, 
bank information. So, what I was uh, telling you a little while back. So, that means to say that two 256 point transforms are computed. So, that is the block switching technique. So, it follows from the block switching technique. Okay. I am not going into the details of this technique because details of this technique are not uh, easily available since it is a um, uh, uh, trademark of Dolby Corporation. So, some information is not uh, fully disclosed, but to achieve this block switching technique, okay, what is being done is that this inverse transform output after being down mixed is split into two buffers okay. and we call this as down mix buffer 1 and down mix buffer 2. Okay. So, this whole thing that means to say that this uh, obtaining this, uh, so starting with this input AC 3 frame okay, and storing the partial inverse transform information into this down mix buffer, this entire thing realizes what is called as the decoder input processing. Okay. Mind you, this has not realized the uh, I mean uh, PCM signals back because ideally, uh, because what we want to achieve at the decoder is that we want to get back the PCM samples, okay. but so far we have not obtained it because we have only stored it into, into the buffer, okay, but we have not yet obtained the PCM output. So, what we have to do is that this decoder input processing what uh, consists of all these blocks exponent unpacking, storing into the MTCT buffer, mantissa unpacking, doing mantissa scaling and denormalization, obtaining the exponent and mantissa part and then doing the partial inverse transformation and down mixing. This whole process is the decoder input processing and the decoder input processing is followed by a decoder output processing. In decoder output processing what we do is that we start with the down mix buffer and then the down mix buffer contents are actually we not only take this down mix buffer, but also by using a shift register like arrangement, we have a delay buffer and delay by how much? Delay by half of the frame times. Okay. The purpose because we are having a down mix buffer and also a delayed version of the down mix buffer. So, that is why we can have a 50 percent overlap. So, in this block what we are doing is that the delay buffer and the down mix buffer contents they are window add and uh, window overlap and add. So, we apply window overlap and add on this down mix buffer and delay buffer contain and the output of this window that goes into the PCM buffer. So, this is where we ultimately achieve the inverse transformation because the window overlap and add is computed over here. So, this is where the PCM samples are obtained back. So, this blocks combinedly we call as the decoder output processing. So, you can see that essentially the decoder has got two parts. One is the decoder input processing which we described little while back and the decoder output processing which I, which I described <coughs> just now. Now, when the down mix buffer is of size 256, then the delay will be done by 128 samples and then we are having a 256 point MDCT computed okay, or rather 256 point inverse MDCT. So, if the block switching flag 
Okay, remember that in the uh, bit stream, we also mentioned about certain flags and one of the flag is a block switching flag. So, if the block switching flag is there, in that case, we are going to have the down mix buffer of size 256 and then we are obtaining a 256 point inverse MDCT and obtain the samples this way. Whereas, if no transient is present, in that case, we will be having 512 point inverse MDCT and how to obtain that? We will be picking up the two down mix buffers together okay, and apply a delay of 256 and have this. So, this arrangement of having the down mix buffer really permits, okay. but how exactly the switching is done, that secret is not known to me. Okay. And uh, to, to know little bit uh, more about uh, what I have already described, in fact, uh, the material that I covered, okay, most of it has been taken from one very uh, interesting paper that is written by Steve Vernon. The title of the paper is Design and Implementation of AC3 Coders. And this appeared in IEEE Transactions on Consumer Electronics, Volume 41, Number 3, August 1995. The page numbers are 754. To, this is not a very long paper, 754 to 759. Okay. And subsequent to this, uh, I mean, no, uh, I mean, not much of uh, very extra information has been added to it. Okay. There is a paper by Davidson. I do not have the complete details with me, maybe in the, okay, let me, let me see. Yes, there is another paper which you can refer to that is by Davidson. Davidson, I write as et al because I do not have the information about the co-authors exactly. And, uh, this paper's uh, title also, I can't, uh, I, I, I will tell you tomorrow. Okay. It is, uh, it appeared in Proceedings of IEEE, Proceedings of IEEE, that is volume 94, number 1. It is a very recent paper, appeared in January 2006. Okay. And this is a paper on the, I mean, if I remember the title correctly, it is on the uh, uh, HDTV uh, standards or something. Okay. This is a paper on the HDTV standards. Okay. Do not remember the title of the paper exactly. And, uh, mm, in, in, in this, uh, um, uh, Davidson et al. not only covered the video standard for HDTV, which is, uh, as I mentioned, is the MPEG-2, but also they covered the AC-3, which is the audio coding standard that has been followed in the HDTV. So, this uh, gives almost uh, similar kind of uh, details. Okay maybe with uh, a few more examples, etc., uh, that you can uh, go through. So, I would uh, advise that you go through both these papers okay, to get a better feel of the AC3 coders. Okay. Uh, in the next class, I will be making a very brief mention about the 
MPEG uh, audio coding standards and then we will go over to the new topic. Thank you.